Good morning. I'm Paul Briggs. Um, all through the, um, the COVID crisis, we've uh, been holding a, a series of webinars. And um, <clears throat> I normally start these by saying, um, saying to everybody that um, I've been the head of the Aviation and Defence Sector Group at Bird & Bird for uh, 18 years. Um, there's some announcements now. Uh, I'm now uh, off council at the firm. Um, the, um, the sector is now being led by uh, Leo Fatterini and, uh, and Lizzie Reed. Uh, uh, I've passed over the leadership to a younger, uh, some might say smarter lawyers. Um, <clears throat> and so my role is now to support, uh, particularly on projects like this, uh, ESG at the firm, which is something that I'm totally passionate about. Uh, I've been uh, in the sector since 1987, at the firm since 2004. Um, Again, uh, when we've been having these programs through, the, uh, through the, the, the crisis, we've often said that the thing we love most about our job is actually going out and meeting clients, hosting real events. Uh, and so we were so looking forward at the end of the COVID crisis, or as it is now looking more under control, to actually seeing lots of people here in our beautiful London offices. So this was uh, advertised, as, um, this was advertised at, as a hybrid event, where they would be, uh, they would be uh, clients physically in the room as well. Um, and um, the, the, our webinar program, uh, it's normally divided between English law led by the famous uh, Andrew White uh, and sector related issues where uh, members of the aviation uh, and defense sector group pick up issues that they're, they're passionate about. So um, uh, facts have yet again, uh, have yet again um, intervened. We have, I think, one of our best ever attendances for this event. I think over 200 people signed up. But uh, so the hybrid event was cancelled not by COVID or by war in Ukraine, but by a tube and train strike in London. So we're very sorry not to see people. And actually, uh, I remember once we were having a, 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 one of our fabulous uh, annual conferences uh, at the Science Museum, and was, you know, that was cancelled because of a chemical spill. So um, things keep intervening. And I should say, one of the webinars that uh, I was actually hosting from my home in Somerset, I was actually mid-speech when I had a total Wi-Fi blackout, uh, and you know, the, the, you know the show must go on. So please bear with us. Uh, we have a, a terrific team uh, today. Uh, I should say that because we've got such a great attendance, everybody is automatically muted. But uh, can I encourage you to please ask questions? There is no such thing as a stupid question. Your questions are confidential. Uh, only the panel can see them. Your uh, name will never be disclosed. We will try and answer the questions as we go. Uh, and uh, during the actual event, uh, just the, the detailed uh, agenda, uh, we have um, a question. We have uh, two parts to the event. The first part of it is really looking at regulation uh, and particularly impact on the financial uh, sector. Then the second part is looking at uh, industry issues, and particularly we have uh, fabulous speakers on behalf of an airline and on behalf of a lessor. So uh, I'm joined today, and I should say bravo Sia, uh, who has joined us in London uh, from Finland, and bravo Timo, who has joined us from Frankfurt, uh, who will both be uh, leading parts of the presentation. They uh, had to uh, get through fairly horrendous uh, transport issues to get here. I should say I came to the office this morning on my bicycle, which was probably the best way to get here. Um, so, <clears throat> please ask questions. Don't allow the, uh, the panelists to feel lonely, uh, jump in, so we feel that uh, it's interactive. There, um, this event will be recorded and will be circulated. So, um, <clears throat> that's the end of the sort of housekeeping. Uh, I get to say a few words by way of introduction. And I'll start. Um, Actually, uh, I was going to say earlier that uh, some people keep asking me if I've retired because I've changed incarnation. And my, my first quote from the day from uh, Mark Twain is that sort of news of my retirement has been greatly exaggerated. Uh, I'm actually still alive and kicking, fully functioning at uh, Bird and Bird. Thank you very much. But my second quote today uh, from Mark Twain, you know, when I joined the aviation industry, uh, goodness, in 1987, I, I looked on the aviation industry as just a thing of excitement and adventure, to travel, to go to interesting places and meet people. Uh, and so Mark Twain, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely on these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things 
cannot be acquired by vegetating in one's little corner of the earth all on one's own. And yet, how has the public perception of travel changed over the years? So uh, this picture is, is very close to my heart. Um, um, flight shame is a real thing. This sort of came home to me particularly when I, about three or four years ago, I asked uh, a couple of my daughters uh, where they wanted to go on holiday for half term. And they said to me, Daddy, we don't want to get on an airplane. And actually, uh, in this picture, the girl in the middle under the, band, uh, under the banner is actually my, my youngest daughter, who at the time thought she wanted to join uh, Extinction Rebellion. I think she may be taking a slightly different path now. But this topic, ESG in aviation and aerospace, just, let's just be clear about this. We're not just talking about compliance. So our event today, we're going to talk firstly about, about compliance, uh, about how do you anticipate what laws are coming before we get on to talking about how you implement a strategy and policy. But it's not just about compliance. A number of our speakers today have been chosen because their organization and that, that individual feels passionate about being an innovator and a champion in ESG and in sustainability, not just somebody who's going to comply with the law. So Greta, I have to say, uh, she can bring me pretty much to tears when she speaks passionately mm. about things she believes in. And so ESG at its biggest level, before we just get on to define it, uh, actually, is, this, is it the end of capitalism as we, as we, as we know it? Some of the, some of the younger uh, people listening uh, may not remember Gordon Gecko and greed is good, but actually at its, at its highest and simplest level, ESG is saying that the sole purpose of a corporation is not shareholder profit. You know, when I joined BAE Systems and I took part in the sort of the change program, we were, we were sort of, it was drummed into us that the purpose of what we were doing was shareholder, shareholder value. But well, actually now, perhaps that is changing. That a lot of corporations believe that they exist for a purpose other than shareholder profit. So ESG, you know, what is it? Uh, and I have to say that uh, I've really been getting more and more interested in this, but only for four or five years. Environmental, social, and governance. Yes, today we're going to focus primarily on the environmental issues, but we will have further events on the social issues and governance issues. So Simon Fippard will join us for part two, and he'll be working with Jaspal from LCI, uh, talking about eVTOL. But one of Simon's other core strengths is in relation to anti-bribery and corruption in the sector. Now, uh, I've also worked in the sector. I've worked in the sector since 1987, and there have been times when the foreign corruption that I've been trying to stamp out hasn't been organized by a rogue salesperson in a faraway destination. It's been organized by the chairman and the chief executive in a way that the, the general counsel has sometimes been obliged to resign on the spot. So our, our sector has a legacy of governance problems. So um, I'm sorry if this seems a little bit sort of messianic, uh, but uh, I think that is kind of my job here to try to you know, get everyone wound up a bit. But the time is now. Uh, every year uh, I sort of, I get my new hobby uh, for what, what is the thing that I'm gonna get really uh, really excited about. So it was digitalization, and for a while it was OEM failures. We were very involved in the grounding, 737 MAX. And I keep saying to people that ESG is the biggest single issue in the sector. Well, COVID intervened, and, and all of the events that I was going to speak at on ESG two years ago or more were cancelled. And so we spent a lot of our time keeping our clients alive through the COVID crisis. But actually, one day COVID will be over, the war in Ukraine will be over, and people will have to face the sustainability in the sector. So uh, Michael Rudd is going to join us at the end. He's going to talk about what are we seeing across many sectors for strategy and policy implementation. And a lot of people say to me, they just don't care about ESG. Still, people say this to me. So I interviewed the chief executive of an airline in the Middle East, a regional airline, who said his customers and the people he deals with don't care about it. Uh, I also speak to uh, uh, financial institutions where the ownership is outside of Europe uh, and North America. And people say to me, HQ doesn't care about this. Well, there's going to come a time when you are not able to raise money in debt or equity markets. You're not, not able to partner with global organizations or to hire and retain high quality people. 
unless you've got a world-class strategy of policy on ESG, and that's coming. And greenwashing, everyone talks about greenwashing in the sector, and, and rightly so. And isn't it amazing and sort of exciting and scary to see uh, the German police uh, 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 arrest uh, people uh, uh, at a Deutsche Bank and have uh, 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 an actual criminal investigation respect mm. greenwashing. Uh, carbon credits is a massive issue we will come back to at another time. So um, the mega trends uh, are, are, are in effect what I'm talking about. And we work very closely with the Royal Aeronautical Society and I got this slide from Sir Brian Burridge, the, the mega trends and climate change is number one. So uh, th this may sound just kind of really obvious, but um, you need a strategy before you've got a policy. And you need to figure out what are your main strategic drivers that are gonna impact you in the sector. Do you want a rating? Are you actually gonna make buy and sell decisions on this? Are, are you actually able to calculate the emissions? And we've got Barry Moss coming, who's gonna talk about PACE, which is one of the leading methods of calculating your scope three and, 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 and all of your emissions. Are you active in the industry uh, groups that are trying to do something about this? And just by way of just to sort of finish my intro, I'll say, as people I've spoken to about this, one of the strategy, strategy directors said, he'd rather do nothing than be accused of greenwashing. Uh, and also I've had people say to me, um, that you know, they're kind of pressure to just to do something. It doesn't matter what it is. They're prepared to take a reasonable risk. So how green do you want to be? Let's come back to this. Not everybody necessarily wants to be green, and for some people, it's an opportunity to buy assets cheaply. We'll come back to uh, EU ETS and to Corsia. So uh, just uh, the aim of this, and the aim of all these sessions is, we want to give an overview for people who are just generally interested, but we also want to give you some meat, some actual, some real proper law for the more detailed people. Now, I've got a couple of real experts with me here, actually physically in the room, well done getting here, amazing job. So Sia, uh, you're not really an aviation expert. You look across many sectors. I'd like you to take us on a little bit of a journey. And I have to say, I, I love some of these slides. I love this slide because when we first did it, it started, I think, in 1970 with a speech by Prince Charles about the, uh, the environment. And everyone thought he was crazy at the time. But can, can you try and demystify and explain what are the regulations that everybody needs to understand that are coming to us now? So back to compliance, what's coming to everybody across different sectors? So take us on a journey. Perfect. Thank you very much, Paul. Uh, good morning to everyone. My name is Sia Miklar. Uh, I work at our Helsinki office in the Energy and Utilities Practice Group. So as Paul mentioned, I'm here today to try to demystify ESG, give you the big picture. And there's actually a few things that I want you to take into consideration when, when listening to my presentation. So firstly, complex problems such as pandemic, uh, climate change, political polarization, that calls upon us to be mentally flexible. This means that in a world that is rapidly changing, we need to use as much time on rethinking than we do thinking. Secondly, Paul mentioned that the time to act is now, yet despite, there's a, despite all the uncertainty with regards to regulation, frameworks, the kind of wait and see approach is not an option if you're looking for success and growth in the future. So you really have to ask yourself, how does success look like in an environment of uncertainty? Because ESG, as Paul told me yesterday, so yeah, ESG, it's not a risk, it's an opportunity. So we'll keep that in mind. Now jumping to the slide, this is a very busy slide uh, and I'll, I'll guide you to it, through it. So if we look at the upper left corner, we're talking about 1960s. This is where the first time sustainable finance was recorded in terms of portfolio managers excluding tobacco companies from, from their activities. Then moving on to 2005, exciting year as in 2005, this was the year when ESG as a term was coined. We're talking about the Who Cares Wins report that also acted as a backbone for UN's principles of responsible investing that came out in 2006. 10 years later, 195, 96 nations signed uh, the Paris Agreement. And then the same year, UN published its Sustainable Development Goal. Paul mentioned that we were hit by COVID, and that's true. However, it, for ESG, there was a tremendous turn in how much, much cash was allocated towards companies <coughs> that had successful ESG dimensions and ratings. 
July 21, we all know the Fit for 55 package uh, that the Commission presented with a lot of regulations stepping in, covering a lot of the sectors with the aim to reduce emissions. Then November 2021, uh, Timo will, will talk, talk you through this later on, but this is a pivotal moment for aligning reporting within the ESG sector. Next slide. So there's a lot happening in the world, especially new geopolitical issues complicating the discussion. And we're even talking about entering a new era, a new world of ESG. So this is really like a illustration of the world rapidly changing, throwing in new challenges that we need to tackle and rethink our positioning. So key ESG issues such as access to energy, human rights, um, the rule of law has been challenged as never before. So in this context, ESG issues might seem irrelevant or even, even to some point uh, trivial. As geopolitical uh, issues kind of create new stories and narratives. What is though clear is that the war has pushed in two directions at the same time. In terms of energy, we can see this through, first of all, when uh, Russia cut, cut the uh, supply to Russian gas, we would see an encouragement of sourcing fossil fuels elsewhere, kind of also highlighting the fact that we are really, we need and will be needing fossil fuels for some, some time. And on the other hand, it really did, did kind of accelerate the business case for renewable energy. So in a very short time, it managed to establish something that decades of pressure has not has failed to do. Slide, please. So this is uh, a slide that we, the ESG team, put together in order to just uh, for ourselves uh, to reflect on the fact that there's a lot of regulation coming in. Okay, how does this look when we look at one pillar specifically? So for me, excitement. For somebody, it might be complexity, and. Uh, of course, this, this complexity in regulation puts a lot of pressure on governments to tie, kind of rethink, modernize regulation, find solutions where the, the intention equals a very good outcome. So let me give you an example where this did not happen. Mexico City in 1989, they had a huge problem with air pollution. So what they did was restrict private driving based on your, your, uh, your car's uh, serial number or license plate. So you were uh, allowed to drive certain days, certain days not. A very straightforward way to reduce pollution and to incentivize uh, people to use public transport. So this backfired. This resulted in actually people buying a second car, usually a more older car and even a more polluting one. So this is where you, in policy making, need to, need to really think where the intention is and how that reflects on the outcome. So I'm a big believer that all the change that we're facing is really a way for us to see opportunities, opportunities to change the way we see the law, especially in how we interpret the law. So the, the challenge is to develop an interpretation of law in a way that we allow for innovation, innovation that will not compromise the, the really key principles of regulation. So we're talking about a very buzzwordy term as future-proof regulation that allows for innovation. In terms of aviation, this would be finding a balance between the goal of economic growth uh, through connectivity, and then again, uh, reduction of climate impact. Next slide, please. So a lot of people talk about this being an acronym soup. And I mean, that illustrates pretty correctly that it's complicated even to the point of confusion. But then again, it works as a perfect philosophical tool because there's a few people that actually get excited about an alphabet soup, uh, a soup and it, it's up to you to make it as nourishing, as good as you can. So it's in your power as an actor to really think, how do I want to present a plate this? What's like the flavors that can get, get us going with this? Next slide, please. And in terms of how you build your strategy, there are key elements, and this is what also comments <coughs> the elements in their core, the environmental, social, and governance. And we'll be talking about more specifically what this means in terms of aviation. 
So I will now give the floor to our finance expert, Timo, who will give you the fundamentals to really guide you through these sometimes rough waters of acronyms. Thank you very much for your time. Brilliant, thanks. So Timo, a number of times I've told you that you've got the most difficult job here because you know, Simon gets to talk about airplanes, you know, a new type of airplane, he loves it. So you're going to try and make financial regulation exciting, interesting, even frightening. So what do people really need to understand about the regulations that we have now and what's coming when? Yeah, thank you, Paul. First of all, uh, yeah, I may also talk about a topic that I'm very passionate about. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, yeah. I totally understand. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, no, yeah, I'm a team of working in the Frankfurt office for inverting the financial uh, So this is why I'm here. Uh, first of all, I think the main takeaways for the next few slides are, despite of going through some of those acronyms, is uh, to get you the feeling that ESG is a very fast and evolving uh, topic and that it's not a good idea to sit back, uh, sit down, lean back, and wait for the market to settle by itself. So starting with um, showing you how fast you can move from recommendation, non-mandatory, voluntary recommendations to mandatory law by using the example of the task force on, uh, on climate-related financial disclosures. This is a group formed by the United Nations, established in 2015, and uh, published the recommendations in 2017. And it started um, with non-mandatory, so voluntary recommendations to track down your uh, climate uh, input um, and publish this with uh, your financial statements, for example. So within only a few years, uh, UK became the first country to uh, mandatory implement those recommendations almost at full scale. So since uh, April 6, 2022, so this year, uh, the largest companies of the UK are required to uh, mandatory uh, report information, which was only a few years before the uh, only just uh, recommendation and voluntary uh, thing. The European Union is to follow, um, and as already announced by SIA on COP26, um, they announced that the European Union will implement the uh, Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, CSRD, another acronym, uh, which I touch base briefly in the next slide, um, and started to go even further with implementing uh, not only the TCFD um, uh, reporting, voluntary reporting uh, recommendations, but going a bit beyond. Next slide, Paul. Thanks. Um, yeah, the CSRD, or the Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive, shall not only uh, relate to financial or non-financial entities, so it touch base on all entities and sets rules to uh, report on your annual statements um, climate-related facts. This is only considering the largest entities at the moment, and it's not um, um, taking into scope all of uh, <coughs> The, the climate um, facts because it's still in development. This is one of the main problems we have with all those acronyms because it's almost on every part, it's delayed, it's still developed, it's changing, it's amending. So, uh, in most sectors, you don't have a clear statement right now. But the European Union is confident and is aiming to finalize this legal act this year. So, reporting shall start 2024 for the financial year of 2023. And um, a few rumors going around, and this is discussing it out here and there, but it's very likely taking also into consideration such things as go three emissions. So this is to show you that it's not clear right now, and you don't have a, a very clear legal act, but you know the European Union is very, very hard keen to, to hold the deadlines, to get it done uh, as soon as possible, and extend the scope as far as possible. Next slide. Yeah, now you can ask, or now we can ask ourselves, is there anything which is uh, already implemented, at least by the most important parts? And since I'm coming from the financial uh, sector, yes, there is indeed something. Uh, the so called sustainability financial, uh, sorry, the sustainability finance disclosure regulation 
and the very famous and most known taxonomy regulation. First of all, taxonomy does not uh, relate to something like tax in, yeah. in, the, in the sense of a VAT. Uh, taxonomy shall help um, to categorize your activities, to set, um, to, to, to enable you as your own owner of your entity to sit down, look at your activities, take the taxonomy regulation as a toolbox and uh, review whether your activities are climate uh, relevant, are sustainable, green, or uh, if they are non-sustainable, uh, non-green. So the uh, SFDR in combination with the taxonomy regulation already obliged the financial market participants to do their reportings right now. Um, and this is a bit of a problem because uh, the taxonomy regulation does not work by giving you a clear, uh, a, a clear description of which activity is good and which are non-good. You have to be very keen and analyze all of your activities and see for each activity itself with a lot, a lot, a lot of uh, other frameworks and level two measures, whether those activities qualify as being sustainable, green or if they even uh, qualify as doing significant harm to other principles. So you see, we have non-mandatory obligations going to be mandatory. Now we have uh, obligations that are currently developing, like the CSRD, and we have a framework which is already existing for the financial sector, but uh, it's still not really uh, completed and it's postponed it many times. So within the next slide, I want to show you how those non-mandatory um, obligations are already now affecting you, for example, by uh, getting new funds for new projects. So if you have the ambition to just wait and then settle the market by itself, and if you not want to, to uh, dig in too deep into the whole ESG thing, this could be, the, uh, be a very bad idea because you are lacking of knowledge in the market standard and you might have a bad deal uh, in the future. For example, looking at the facility agreements right now, um, we see further or an extending uh, number of sustainable green loans, which is not very much to say, to be fair, because the purpose of the loan needs to be strictly connected to a sustainable thing. So. Um, this would be only like a forestation, for example, and, and uh, this is not the typical uh, things you're getting away with uh, to, to do those uh, stuff. But what we see with a very large increasing number are the sustainable or green linked loans. Thereby, you are uh, agreeing on key principles. For example, taking the aviation sector uh, as a manufacturer, you agree with the bank who's uh, granting you the loan to reduce your carbon emissions say about 5% within the next 20 years. And if you reach this goal, uh, you are fine, and the margin, for example, will decrease. But if you miss that goal, the way that your margin will uh, increase. So you have to pay more for your loan if you don't meet your key, uh, key points. So at least for this aspect, this is not a mandatory thing, but we see it increasingly because the banks are obliged to report and they have to make sure that their investments are sustainable or green. Um, and if you are not aware of your standing in the market, you might get a bad deal. If you're lacking on arguing with the banks or other participants on future investments. So I hope that you now get a bit of a feeling that uh, those uh, issues are increasingly, are extensively going further, and um, that it's not a good idea to just sit and wait, but rather go forward and try to, to make uh, your clear what is your market position and what can you reach by, by having a clear standing. Totally brilliant. I should say, you two have stuck absolutely rigidly to time, so uh, <laughs> you're not the only one who was running over. So. Um, the, uh, so I think uh, it'd be great for one of our next sessions, maybe you and Matthias, to dig into this a bit more as to what is a green loan, what is a sustainably linked transaction, and what are we now seeing in aviation, and how's it going to evolve, how's it going to move into aircraft leases, for example. 
So listen, totally brilliant. Can I just say, uh, can we get some questions coming up? Because we have, uh, we have after the, 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 the next two speakers, we have a slot of questions. So please, I mean, I think the questions are, what is a green loan and what is sustainably linked finance and what's greenwashing? It's super interesting. So first of all, sort of outside speakers. So Ulrika, just absolutely delighted you could join us. I mean, I know that um, every conference now is trying to get you to speak at it because everybody is now excited about impact and what you're doing. So um, I guess Timo has kind of, uh, sort of led the way for you here in terms of the regulations that are coming. But, uh, and also, in addition to just a sort of, bit of a sort of waving the flag for impact, I'm interested to know what, what is it that you care about? What are you trying to achieve and who you're trying to bring into impact and, and what's it going to achieve? So it's you know, over to you. Okay, perfect. Now, thanks very much and good morning to everyone. Uh, thanks for having me, which is much appreciated. Um, and, you know, I'm the president of Impact. I have a very long history in aviation finance. I've worked on investment funds for aircraft. But what I now see as the purpose, I truly of my professional life is to, to work towards enhancing sustainability in aviation. We've been dormant way too long and we can't sit back and just wait for someone else to do that. So what are who is Impact? We're a nonprofit association representing roughly 33 banks, Lesors investors and now KPMG who have decided to bring all the force, all their power together and their, their brain power to really help, you know, decarbonize the industry. Sia, Timo, thanks very much for your insights. I think it really shows that sustainability comes with lots of complexity and lots of unknowns. And I think even more though, you know, we can't sit back and wait for the market to, to make it happen, but we need to take some action. And what I would like to do today is really give you the thoughts of an ex-banker or someone who's trying to change the, the you know, the, the way that banks think about sustainability. Um, so what do banks do in terms of aviation? I think we have like three pressure points that I've seen over the last couple of years. We had BAL2, which made quite some banks review what, whether they want to allocate regulatory equity towards aviation. Then you have COVID hitting. And that again shows you know, how short-term vulnerable our industry is. And that really resuscitates quite some corporate memories in the bank saying, do we want to ex be exposed you know, to an industry so cyclical? Um, on top of that, you have that topic we're talking about today, sustainability. That's adding a lot of pressure. Um, and I must say our sector has not been at the forefront of decarboni decarbonization. And I'm very blunt. And also that long-standing argument, we only have 2 to 3% of the global footprint. Sorry, gentlemen and ladies, this is not going to work because other industries are going to decarbonize a lot faster. We have more people flying. And then you have the public perception, right? That just adds on top of that. And we're one of the most visible pollutants and we get all the, you know, flight shaming. Um, so how can someone in the bank really say, oh, I feel comfortable with the industry? And then you have the regulations that uh, Sia and, and Timo just mentioned. And we all know regulation will happen, but we don't know how it's going to translate into our everyday lives. I mean, will we see curtailing of flights, which will have an impact on aircraft values? Will we see a major impact of sustainability in the rating systems? Will actually wear down our return equities? So quite some question marks, I guess, from bank managers when it comes to deciding how they want to allocate their portfolios. So, you know, it's really about what will the future composition of a bank's portfolio look like? Um, and I guess there's, as I said, question marks. And ultimately, this will lead to aviation being in competition with other industries, which are, you know, faster to decarbonize, which are less energy in intensive. And I guess we'll also see the funds dry out to some extent. And what I cannot accept is the argument We've got alternative um, lenders, we've got PE, the capital markets, they'll make up for it. Sorry, this is not going to happen long term because there will be similar pressure coming from that side as well. So what do I think we need? It has to be a truly catalytic approach by the wider finance industry to really motivate our airline clients to bring down their CO2 footprint. This is no finger pointing, this is not punishing, this is working together hand in hand to get this done. And if we can ascertain long-term funding perspective for the airlines, you know, the money that's required into for new technology, self-hydrogen, will just follow suit. Um, I also would like to stipulate that I personally would like to see real world cuts in CO2. I mean, doing offsetting by planting trees, that's nice, and we must continue to do that. But that must not 
lead us away from the true responsibility, which is again bringing our absolute CO2 footprint down. So, what can you know impact contribute to that one? I mean, what we strongly advocate is having data. I mean, only 15% of all airlines produce data. The kind of data we see is all over the place. You can't compare it like for like. There is no standardization. And think about it. We're facing one of the biggest problems of, of humankind, and we leave it to some extent to a random approach that some airlines have or not have or some regulators have. Sorry, we need to be resp take responsibility for that one. So, you know, we're advocating getting the data in a format that we can use and translating that into certain KPIs that allow us and our clients to measure the carbon footprint and also to track it going forward. And we're quite advanced with a white paper that's coming to the market in the next couple of weeks. Uh, some tangible KPIs that we would like to discuss with a wider market and that can ideally be used uh, going forward. And obviously, that's all nice having KPIs, but we need to also acknowledge that these KPIs need to actually be moved into a, you know, a certain framework when it comes to loan documents. Um, but that's not all. This is like a technical part. But, you know, three points that very much linger onto, on my mind that might be more philosophical, strategical. We need, you know, as, as the banks, replace the return-focused short-termism that we've been depicting for so long with a view on focus on long-term shareholder value. You know, there, there are opportunities out there, as Sia and Timo mentioned. This is not like we're giving up, but there are opportunities going forward. And there's demand for sustainable finance is going to grow massively going forward. Investors will focus on it. So let's use this opportunity, right? And make that first step. It might be painful, but there's a reward uh, at the long end. We as bank also need to have, you know, sustainability principles that guide our long-term thinking. And that needs to feed into our long-term strategy. And also we need to hold our clients accountable. We want them to also adopt certain strategies to show that they're moving ahead in decarbonization. And also, just food for thought, offsetting, again, tree planting is nice, but if you as a bank commit money for aviation, why not allocate a certain part of your regulatory equity also that goes into alternative uh, methodologies like SAF, like hydrogen, or similar to really enhance and, and show your commitment towards the industry as well. Um, so if all falls into place, you know, I'm, I'm very sure that we can secure the future of aviation. We're going to lessen the risk of extremely drastic regulatory measures. Um, we'll enable the banks to keep their portfolios and continue funding. And I think ultimately it's also a question of risk management for everyone who's got their aircraft on their balance sheet. Because if regulation kicks in, I'm sure we will see a massive uh, negative impact on aircraft values. That's not good for lenders. That's not good for the owners. Um, to conclude, I mean, the changing or transforming our industry and tackling the climate change is probably one of the biggest transformations that we will ever see in our history, right? But I think those people who are leaders in sustainability and the people who champion the decarbonization, they will provide the true value for the stakeholders and they come out as the winners. And I think all of us must have the ambition, you know, to become a winner on, on that subject. And I think there's also good news. I know it's challenging what we're aiming for, what we need to achieve. But, you know, comfort is derived from we've never been that knowledgeable, we've never been so powerful, and we've never been so connected. So let's leave egos aside, sit down, get to work, and make this happen. And thanks very much for, for your audience. Um, and, uh, you know, hey, for Ulrike, yeah. Nice passionate ending there. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, listen, uh, that was a sort of a very quick canter through. And I think if you could just, we've got some great questions coming in. So, Ulrike, if you could steal yourself to answer some of those questions. Barry. Um, We've, uh, we've worked together for a long time. Uh, I think, you know, initially with you as a sort of leading uh, aircraft insurance advisor. And then for a long time, you've been advising us and helping our clients with EU ETS. You've now got a, a far bigger role. So, so scope three, you know, what is it? What does it mean for a financial institution? Uh, and what does it mean for, you know, for, you know, actually, how does anybody calculate their emissions? Thank you, Paul. And, and, uh, Great to join everyone here this morning from Burdenburg's Brussels office. Um, so, scope three emissions for financial institutions. This has already been covered by you, Paul, and also you know from Timo and Sia and, and Ulrich. So, I won't go into, into too much detail here. But this is now you know, this is now real. This this isn't fictitious. Uh, you know, every aircraft lessor 
financier, insurer, investor uh, is going to have to report its portfolio emissions, uh, even on the TCFD, CSRD, um, and coming down the road in the States to SEC as well. So what needs to be re re reported here? So this is predominantly for the aircraft finance and leasing uh, industry. Scope was known as scope three emissions. Let me just go back to that slide, Paul, for one second. Sorry, I, uh, your slides just, uh, they've got a life of their own here. Oh, okay. Uh, right. I keep my so, foot on their neck, but they're running, they're running away from me. Not a problem. So the scope three uh, emissions are from uh, an aircraft, so for example, Lessel's portfolio. So the aggregate amount of, of the emissions produced from the aircraft in the portfolio. For an airline, it will be scope one um, emissions from their from their fleet. So scope one for an airline, scope three for a lessor uh, needs to be reported. Scope two, by the way, is just the, the energy uh, and power and heat that um, businesses use um, from electricity and, and heating, etc. Um, so what how do we we actually measure this stuff? So you know this is all important and, and it's and, it, and it's it's actual as, as Timo said, there's a legal requirement to report this information now, particularly in the UK from the, the 6th of April for premium uh, <coughs> listed companies. So um, the way we do this uh, is quite simple under um, the the the, um, the 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 business we have, which is pace. Um, so what we do, if we move on to the next slide, there we go. So for the platform for analyzing carbon emissions pace. So we take in effectively every commercial flight every day. So, uh, that's over a hundred thousand flights a day get ingested into the system. We take that information in from AirNav, which covers about 99.5% of all flights. Sorry, Brian, if we can go back to the previous slide. Um, we calculate the great circle distances between uh, the, the two city pairs for every flight. We apply the, the standard ICAO fuel burn methodology, convert that into carbon emissions, um, and then take in additional data concerning the ownership, uh, MSNs, and uh, seat configuration for every aircraft. So from that, we can actually build out a profile for every aircraft, every airline, uh, every operator, and also the world's fleet portfolio. Um, sorry, we just go back to the previous slide. So here's is uh, an example of Air France showing their activity from the 1st of January this year. We can see that uh, their emissions are creeping up uh, as, as we move into the summer period. Um, but interestingly enough, the, the emissions per, per seat kilometer remain relatively flat. Um, and we also show uh, each individual aircraft type within the, the fleet. So they have 27 different aircraft types. And how that um, how that that builds up the profile, which are the most um, carbon emitting aircraft. Uh, the important thing here also is 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 the actual amount. So what we, the, what Pace does actually is at the click of a mouse, it actually enables aircraft lessors, finances, or other to to see what their TCEFD um, reporting uh, obligations are. Now this can be built into sustainably linked KPIs um, for. For transactions, um, this is an example of a, a Singapore Airlines transaction, uh, but a similar deal was done for British Airways last year um, under WTETCs, which is backed by a UKEF um, uh, guarantee. Um, and what these actual figures do here is that they, they provide the KPIs necessary for doing sustainably linked uh, financing going forward. Um, and all this is done at click of a mouse and um, the other in, in, in interesting information here, um, following up on what we said earlier, is that all this has been independently audited and verified by KPMG. Um, so the methodology, and I saw that one of the questions asked about audit costs and transparency. Um, so this has all been baked into the system. So um, rather than having to, to manage the, these transactions going forward, drill down into granular uh, MSN um, activity, it, it's all within the system. Um, we'll place those slides here, but this final slide here um, shows right. the what what can be done in terms of reducing emissions. So, so obviously um, the easiest or one of the quick solutions is is refleeting, which is expensive operation because um, aircraft are expensive assets. But by taking out old aircraft and putting in new ones, as under the EU aviation taxonomy. Um, will reduce uh, emissions somewhat. If we can go back to the previous slide. 
if not um, by in incorporating SAF, uh, will also reduce the, the emissions by some uh, to some degree, and also aircraft operations on the ground. But as you can see here, this is a, a trajectory based on uh, the European Fit for 55. So the, the, the blue line that's, that's trending downwards is what needs to be achieved. Um, and the, the, the other colors in combination, um, like SAF, refleeting, whatever, you can see there's still a huge gap. Um, and you can see that in order to offset that gap, we require something like 40 million um, carbon offsets. So an expensive operation. Um, so I just really, I'd just like to final, just to wrap up on that by saying that, you know, the, what, what we're concerned about here is, is, is greenwashing. Um, you know, it's one thing for a leasing company to go out and say, well, yeah, we're replacing our, our, our portfolio with more efficient aircraft, you know, replacing COs and NEOs and whatever, and, and gaining to like 15% carbon reductions. Well, that, that's all good and dandy. The problem is if you're going out and buying an, an additional 60 aircraft that you're just adding to the, the global fleet, then you know that, mm. that's not achieving anything. And that, that's just pure greenwashing unless you're reporting that. Um, and one of the big issues going forward is, is reputational risk. And we've, we've touched on this before. You know, it's one thing for an airline to, to have to take it on the chin, but ownership brings responsibility. You know, if you owned a dog and a dog bite bit the postman, um, then that's your that's your responsibility. That that's that's not the dog walkers. So you know, everyone in the chain here has an obligation to to reduce emissions and report them accurately and in a consistent fashion. So I think I'd just like to leave that message and uh, pass over. And I think we're still on time. Thanks, Paul. Yeah. All right, totally tremendous, and, 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 and I like your sort of vision on this greenwashing at the end. So listen, we've got some pretty punchy questions coming here, so if uh, Ulrika and Barry, if you could just brace yourself for some of these. And maybe the uh, the last one, and then let's see if you want to jump in on this. Europe seems to be leading the way on sustainable aviation regulation. However, there seems to be much less interest in the rest of the world. How can Europe be competitive and sustainable at the same time? Geopolitical, big question. I mean, Ulrika, do you want to crack at that first? Yeah, sure, absolutely. I, I think one one of the points is really to create awareness, and that's what we're trying to do with uh, with Impact. Uh, this is not like a European or German show; it has to be a global show. So we've been able to attract interest, um, you know, from from China. We're talking to people in Japan and Asia overall in the US. I think creating that awareness, getting access to the local regulators, that's the first step, you know, to to define a, a common platform and a common denom domino denominator of that. And I must say, yes, indeed, I do agree. If you're at the forefront of something, something, it always comes with an investment. You'll never have a return your next day, right? But you have to have some time and ammunition and keep your powder dry. So it, it, it's going to happen. It's going to work uh, towards my way. And I think that's all we can do is truly, again, get many people on board across the various continents and talk to the local regulators and use also political power to open some open some eyes. Yeah, and maybe to to get a bit more uh, of the, the lawyer uh, inside uh, of this, the, the European Union is uh, seeing the problems with the various sectors. It's not only the aviation sector; there are many different sectors who are uh, having the same problem. So, uh, in all those very very uh, in this huge mass of, of legal uh, legislation acts and draft acts and measurements etc um, they try to to set certain points to uh, help the sectors as well so since it's all in development currently um, yeah that's not the way to to get a clear uh, statement on a, a specific sector but um, the approach of the European Union is taking what is agreed worldwide on the United Nations such as TCFD pack it into a legal framework and prepare it to extend it further and uh, dig a bit deeper. So um, it seems to be the case that uh, they are going to get into ESG very hard on the first uh, day. But I think many parts of it are preparation right now. And if, our, if you set your business model in the right way, then you can profit maybe from such a strict regulation. I mean, totally fascinating geopolitical question. And Simon, I know that uh, you often talk on Brexit-related issues. So, I mean, hopefully, uh, maybe you know, before we rejoin the European Union, uh, the, the UK will uh, be uh, also be a leader in this area. Um, so, just the first question here again, um, in you know the nuts and bolts of this, 
Within a sustainably linked deal, what can be done to improve transparency and reduce costs of verifying the routine KPI checks? So that's into the nuts and bolts as to how's it going to work. I mean, Ulrike, I guess maybe the, I don't know if you or Barry have got a view on this as to uh, how's it going to work in practice for transparency and the cost of it. And I guess who do you, who do you trust? You know, and, and the whole what's the status of the rating agencies in this, and what's the credibility of the rating agencies? Mm-hmm. Barry, do you want to go first? Yeah, I'll go first. Thank you. But, but I think one of the issues here is you know ESG credit rating agencies. Um, I think it's a big question mark over that. Um, they're, they're not fungible. You, you, you can't take one rating from one agency and compare it with another as you can with financial risk. And I think that's the big downside to that. And it will also become regulated under the EU. So, um, you know, as we'll, we'll data analytics is, is what, you know, so the, 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 the products that the pace are providing. So the, this will become a regulated activity. And, and, it, and it does need, it's still a bit wild west out there. Um, but it, it will improve, um, and, and law has to be complied with. You know, you, you can't ignore that. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And I think also, you know, presenting tangible KPIs that show that you know with these we can measure and track uh, the the developments. That does also help. You know, to finding a, a common standard. I think when, once we have that in place. Uh, you know, we we know exactly what kind of data to ask uh, for when we talk to our airline clients and they know what to deliver. And I think that makes the process easier. And that hopefully, you know, when it comes to verification, we can move towards, you know, what we see in other, you know, project finance structures that your client delivers the information to you, does the calculation and you you double check on a random basis whether or not this is compliant. I would just add to that also that, you know, we're talking not just to aircraft finances and lessors, but also to the airlines. So we're having a system like, uh, you know, Pace where both parties, you know, uh, counterparties can coalesce around. Um, and that information is, is totally transparent. It's been fully audited by KPMG, KPMG with respect to the methodology. So you can drill down into that and you can see, you know, the, the, the methodology and, and how it works. Now, you know, different different affinity groups will have may have different methodologies. Well, that's fine, you know, as long as they're transparent and transparency is all here. Terrific. And I, I think we will probably have a follow-up event actually just on the taxonomy and the sector report around it. So just um, another uh, good question here. Our industry will continue to burn hydrocarbons for a long time and come so how how do we rebut the greenwashing claims? Surely if we buy new technology aircraft to replace older tech aircraft, it's a step in the right direction, but it, it should not be seen as greenwashing. It is really the only viable option. SAF helps, but it's not readily available at, at all airports. So for many years to come, moving to more modern aircraft is the only option, isn't it? Okay, well, this is quite a controversial one. So that, and I sometimes say it's a bit like um, you buy a house and you replace the kitchen. You, know, you rip out an old-fashioned kitchen and put in a sustainable kitchen. Is is that the green thing to do? So is is it environmental? Is it part of the uh, the uh, environmental movement to buy new airplanes? I think Ulrike, you may have touched on this a little bit earlier. Yeah, exactly. I, I think it is part, and I wouldn't accuse it of greenwashing, but obviously. We cannot just sit aside and say we're place, replacing new technology or old technology aircraft with new technology, right? Because we know traffic traffic is going to increase. I think it also has to do what do you do with your existing fleet? And I tell you, we have quite some controversial discussions in our working groups. What does that mean for you know for for an airline with midlife aircraft? Does that mean closing down the business because they can't afford to replace, or is it more about certain aircraft types we th- we think are eligible you know for improvement uh, on operational basis on technological basis and we're drilling into all that i don't have the perfect answer as of now um but you know certainly we need to tackle each and every angle it's it will be new technology upgrading existing technology revising our our flight routing uh you know to efficiency training of the pilots every little bit counts but is there a perfect answer i don't have one i must say Okay. Okay. We're gonna we've got a few more minutes just to sort of wrap up. We've got another good question. It's sort of uh, older MSN, uh, man, you know, aircraft. Uh, is the value being harmed compared to newer aircraft? Because you know, what's the what's the impact of, of the new technology on the residual value of the existing fleet? Uh, is there any idea on how this will influence the ticket pricing for airlines or on-demand cargo logistics? So there are quite a number of issues there. 
Uh, and so, so clearly, I would say a big jump in technology when widely adopted does impact the residual value of older airplanes. And I know that Ulrika, I'm sure a number of your members, uh, I'm sure a number of them are now saying as part of their strategy to be uh, more green, mm -hmm. they only want to have new technology equipment in their fleets. You know, it's like the previous question. So uh, I don't know if, if, uh, if uh, uh, either of you, Barry or Ulrika, like to say anything about this, but uh, for aircraft, for people invested in old technology aircraft, uh, this is, you know, uh, another, another impact. And so the financing of older aeroplanes becomes a bit of a separate market with separate laws mm -hmm. of supply and demand. Mm -hmm. well, I could, I'll recue you first this time. Yeah, exactly. No, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's the risk we definitely see that, you know, um, older midlife aircraft will see a, a, a drop in values uh, going forward and actually hit um, hit the, the owners and the financiers of it. Uh, and that's why I'm saying, you know, we need to think about how can we enhance these aircraft? How can we make sure that we still have a long enough useful life without too much affecting you know on sustainability again there's no there's no perfect answer i think it will be a combination of ver various methods uh, going forward to be quite honest and and just to add that i think one of the risks is is, is what's known as transition risk um the fact that uh, older aircraft may end up as stranded assets as we've seen in covid you know the first aircraft that were parked up during the pandemic were the old ones the least efficient to operate um, you know, the more fuel intensive and, and maintenance intensive aircraft. So, you know, uh, as with other assets in other industries, it's the older, less efficient equipment gets phased out first. Um, if that happens, you know, the, it, it will affect residual values. And I think one of the big problems with also with older aircraft is the ability of, to, of them to use SAF. At the moment, is a blending mandate of 50%. Um, now, uh, new technology aircraft, all of them are expected to be to be able to run on 100% SAF, but the older ones, um, a lot of them can only run on a maximum of 50% because the aromatics in the fuel provide lubrication to the seals and that sort of thing. So, mm -hmm. um, and that could mean that, you know, major technical upgrade, which is could could actually cost more than the value of the, the aircraft or the engine. So, again, wow. that's a commercial decision that mm -hmm. needs to be considered. But, but then you could obviously also argue, you know, do you take the the energy that has gone into producing the aircraft, right, an existing aircraft, uh, do you just disregard it, you know, going forward, say, well, I have, I have a new aircraft, uh, or disregard how much energy is actually going to the production of a new aircraft. So if you compare that like for like upgrading an old aircraft, a midlife aircraft versus producing a new one, right? And there's many questions that we see our faced, uh, that, that we see ourselves faced actually, you know, by the industry coming forward saying, how do you explain that? Uh, and so we're working hard to get some tangible solutions or suggestions uh, that we can work upon. Yeah, and, and hence the EU taxonomy, you know, the, the, the circular economy of, of taking older aircraft and recycling the parts of those aircraft into new builds, um, you know, again, seems to make an awful lot of sense. Mm -hmm, absolutely. Uh, just say we're we getting some, you know, cracking questions in now. I'm delighted that uh, um, uh, we're causing so much excitement with the questions and a lot of questions about OEMs and, and sort of the residual value of older aircraft types. And I should say that I've spent much of my, the last two years involved in P2F, passenger to freighter, which is again a very interesting part of the market. So I think this is bringing to an end the sort of first part of the session. Uh, I mean, I, I should say you guys have spoken on some quite complex topics and made them sort of clear and interesting. Um, if, you'd like, if you'd like the fun bits to come, sorry to say that, guys. The, uh, we've now got a, a Ashan from Virgin Atlantic, and as you expect, that'll be a really fascinating, interesting presentation. Uh, and Jasper, who is the chief executive of LCI. Uh, and also Simon will be talking about uh, eVTOL. So we have a 10 minute break now, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll restart at 10 past 10. I think there's, there's some uh, uncertainty on that on the agenda. But I think, uh, the, I think uh, you said, uh, of course we were planning to have people physically in the office. So a uh, short break now, and we'll restart again shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.